Okay, hello everyone. My name is Andrew Allen. I'm a PhD student with the Fish and Wildlife Department at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And today I'm going to talk to you about scaling up animal movement and understanding the individual variation in movement patterns to infer population level movements. So I thought the title of the symposium was a pretty good introduction to my talk. Um, animal movement in the environment is a core component of movement ecology. And we've seen huge advances in movement ecology recently, advances in tracking systems, allowing us to track ever, an ever-increasing number of species, also advances in the ways that we can analyze our movement data and then relate this to the environment. For example, this image here is um, an example of some laser scanning we do at our university, giving us not only the landscape structure, but also the forest structure and canopy height. So why do we do this? We want to understand why animals move, where they move, when they move, and what the drivers of those movements are. But the challenge for, I think, all of us, is fair to say, is that we can't track the whole population. So this knowledge is derived from the few individuals that we do track. But of course, why they move, when they move, it varies between individuals. So I just want to demonstrate this with an example. This is some moose in northern Sweden. And it's a year of data. Um, and First off, uh, we track four individuals, and the movements are quite small scale, largely sedentary, except for maybe the blue individual. As we increase our sample, now we start to see clear migratory movements down to the southeast. And if you watch the red one, I'm not sure what he's doing, but he kind of goes everywhere. And um, as we increase the sample again, you're going to see an increasing scale of movement. And now we have moose going south, going north. Scales gone from a few kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. So this is all the same study area. So what is driving this variation in movements? And the target for us is to try and understand what it is. Of course, it has implications for management. A core component of our group's work is to link animal movement with wildlife management um, and use the knowledge we gain from movement ecology in um, decision making. So for example, if we consider this example, if you just took the first four, your scale of management would be quite small, just on a local sedentary movement. As we increase the sample, you would need to increase your scale of management to capture those smaller scale migratory movements. And if we take the full sample, then you've got scale of management, which is hundreds of kilometers. So we all understand, understand what drives this variation. So perhaps we can predict this across the landscape, um, understand the ecology of the species better, and then also improve wildlife management. So the objectives of my study is to quantify this variation in movement strategies and space use, relate the movement patterns to life history variables and the environment, and understand what the causes of variation are. So in terms of movement data, our study site is fair to say Sweden. It's in um, Northern Europe. We've got six study sites, or study areas, should I say, two in the north, four in the south, um, the red dots here is each individual, and um, as you can see, we've got a few study sites in some of the study areas, such as in the north, and also if you pay attention to the island down in the south, because that will come up a couple of times in the talk. Um, so as I say, 350 moose and 560 moose years. A, a moose year is effectively one continuous year of data. So for example, if you track an individual for three years, that's three moose years. And then we have a large latitudinal spread of nearly 1,500 um, kilometers. And then we looked at three levels of variation. <clears throat> the first is between study areas. So how does one study area vary to the next and another? And then within study areas, so individuals, between individuals in the same study area. And then finally, variation within an individual, so between years. In terms of methodology, the first step was to understand the types of movement that we see in the population. So whether this is migratory, sedentary, dispersal, or nomadic. And for this, we use the net squared displacement approach. I know I'm in the movement model section, but I'm afraid this is the only equation you're going to see. Um, but basically, you can fit movement models to the displacement of a species over time. And then based on the fit of that model, you can inf um, determine their movement strategy. And what's nice about this method is it can also provide provide you information on the duration and timing of movements. And this I use later on in my study. And depending on the model parameters you use, you can either get the average for the population, or you can actually get this for every individual. The home range method, we use the 95% utilization distributions, and we use the bias random bridge, which 
um, effectively it's a movement kernel and biases the kernel towards the next location. We calculated both annual and seasonal ranges <coughs> and these were estimated on a grid that was estimated for each individual using the min and max XY locations. And this is because we use the utilization distribution to extract the environmental variables and this we obviously want to do at the same scale. So for seasonal ranges, often the season is defined by something like month, January, February, March, but we wanted this to reflect what the movement of the species is doing. So for migratory moose, well this is really easy. When do they arrive at the winter range? When do they leave? When do they arrive at the summer range? When do they leave? There you have winter and summer home ranges. So this is what we use the results of the net squared displacement for um, to actually pick up the full time of the summer and winter. And of course, this also captures the variation in what individuals are doing because they're arriving at, across a span, time span of two months at the winter and summer ranges. We can't really do this for sedentary moose though because they're in the same area all year round. Um, but instead, we wanted to use environmental variables that reflect what they may be, how they may be moving in the landscape. So for summer, we use the growing season. So when does it start? How long is it? And for the winter, <coughs> we took the arrival and departure date of snow. Um, but because it would be quite variable, um, across years, we took the average arrival date and the average departure date of snow. So in terms of the movement variables we used, we used elevation, um, northness, uh, especially in northern latitudes where we are, south facing slopes can be more productive. Um, also looked at the steepness of the slope, uh, road density, and this is a weighted road density. So for example, fenced highways carry a much higher weighting than um, forest roads, for example. Uh, land cover so data for the landscape structure. Um, we got weather station data um, for daily snow depth across the 10 years of the study. And then we created a raster for every day of the year for the snow depth so that we can get the snow depth where the individual was in space and time. And up here is that black dot is a moose. It's just an example. Um, and I'll just run you through a year of snow in Sweden and the migratory movement of a moose. And then the last, example, uh, the last data we used was life history variables of age and sex. So moving on to results and first movement type. Um, so there's definitely a divide between the north and the south of Sweden. In the north, over 70% of moose were migratory. Um, whereas in the south, um, all, the, all the southern regions, so S1 to S4, um, they were all sedentary. And then movements of dispersal and nomadic didn't really feature in our study areas um, or not in the models, should I say. Um, looking at the variation within the, in the north and the south, in the north there certainly was some variation in the proportion of movement strategies, with some areas having 100% migratory, but other areas having 50% or less of migratory movements. And if we look at the south, certainly a lot less variation, um, just generally more sedentary movements. But again, this island I pointed out, we do have a higher proportion of migratory movements on there, uh, 25%. And then looking at the variation between years. So moose do switch from migratory to sedentary and then perhaps back again. Um, so for this, we obviously needed moose that had uh, a couple of years of data at least. So for this aspect, it was 117 moose and 330 moose years. So nearly three years per moose. And in the north, we have 68 moose. In the south, 49. And as you can see, nearly 25% of the moose in the north switch the strategy from migratory to sedentary or vice versa. Um, whereas in the south, this was lower down at about 10%. Um, so quite interesting. Moving on to home range. Um, so comparing migratory moose in the north and the south. Um, migratory moose in the north have much larger home ranges, um, five, six times larger. Even sedentary moose had home ranges that were generally twice as large in the north compared to the south. Um, if you compare the summer versus the winter home ranges, um, again, the summer home range is much larger in the north and also big differences in the north between the summer and winter range where the summer range is perhaps two to three times larger in the summer compared to the winter. And there's a general trend that summer ranges are always larger than winter ranges except for the study region three um, where the winter range is actually larger than the summer. So moving on to trying to understand some of this variation that we see, sex is clearly um, a cause of variation in moose, males are a lot bigger, and this is perhaps reflected in the home range size, where they're often home ranges are tw twice as large as the females, 
And this is true for the north, which is on the left, and the south. This is just one of the study areas. If we look at age, um, so here we're looking at the north, and uh, it's, you can see a trending age, especially between age two and age three. Sorry, the ages are quite probably faint, but it goes from two to 14. Um, and yeah, there's a correlation of about 0.17, which obviously isn't strong, but it's a slight effect. Um, and if you look at the south, again, you see this big gap between age two and three, but here the correlation is much weaker, or non-existent, you could say, um, other than this two to three. So if we look at the habitat composition of moose, so for every moose, we got the home range, we extracted the habitats that form part of that home range, and here I've just summarized the main ones. I, to display you or to visualize it, you don't want to include everything. For the four southern study sites, um, coniferous forests uh, certainly forms the main component of the home range, um, over 40% in general. But again, if you look at the top right, that study site three, um, Kelmar is on the mainland, which reflects normal habitat composition, 40% uh, coniferous forest. But if you look at Erland, where we had more migratory moose, um, here, arable land makes up 40% of the home range. And if you compare Erland to all the others, it stands out there on its own. If you look at the north, which is the bottom two in the figure, they have more um, broadly foresting the home range and also um, thickets. And this is across the whole year. If we look at the seasonal home range composition, um, in the south, I guess as you can expect, because it's mainly sedentary movements, the composition is the same between the winter and the summer. But if we look at the habitats um, of the migratory moose in the north, in the summer it's mainly composed of broadleaf forests and thickets, whereas in the winter they're moving down to the coniferous forests. So we did a discriminant analysis using the variables we'd chosen just to see the group, how they grouped. And um, it was quite, so in the top right figure, it's just the names of the study areas, but the main interesting point is that our southern study areas and where the sedentary moose are in the north, they're all clumped together with the main variables here being coniferous forests, clear felled, um, clear felled areas. Our migratory moose are over to the left, and this is due to things like elevation, slope, broadleaf forests, which I guess are all variables that are quite correlated. And then, of course, this one that's all out on its own on the bottom is this island called Erland, where you've got arable land and urban pulling it down. So finally, um, looking at snow, um, <coughs> so there was a difference in snow depth um, between the north and the south, um, obviously, because of latitudinal differences. Um, snow depth is on average 60 centimeters in the north, uh, about three times higher than the south. But interestingly, the number of snow days isn't too different. It's about four months in the north compared to three months in the south. And up here, I've just got the winter home ranges again for the north and the south to compare. And I mean, if you compare, consider the difference in snow depth, the home ranges don't actually appear to be that different. And there's actually a region in the south which has a larger winter home range. But then perhaps if you also consider that in the summer, these moose in the north are moving on a scale of three times larger. So I guess you could, yeah, maybe it affects their movements, maybe it doesn't, if you consider the full scale that they are actually moving. We also want to understand how snow might affect them from year to year. And it was actually quite nice that in the south, we had quite variable snows across snow depths across three years. So in 2010 was quite high snow year. Um, 2011 was a low snow year that was quite short. And then 2012 was more a normal snow year. And we picked nine moose in the south. These are basically the only ones we had that had data across all three of these years. Um, so in 2010, I've just got the home range for an individual. And in 2011 is the change in the home range for that year. And for um, six of the nine individuals, they increased their home range compared to the previous year. And then in the following year, when the snow depths increased again, eight of the nine individuals reduced their home range compared to 2011. Um, so it appears that snow may affect their movements from year to year. What's also nice about having this daily snow depth data is you can use it to understand what may be influencing the migratory movements of moose. So for here we have blue, in blue we have the displacement of the moose, and in red we have the arrival of snow and the increasing snow depth. And um, it's apparent that moose are actually staying in the summer range until the snow is reaching a depth of 60 centimeters, and then they're migrating 100, 150 kilometers through um, 60 centimeters of snow or more by the time they finally get to their summer range, uh, winter range. 
Um, and this is something that we hope to do more with in coming up in the future, is understanding how the changes in the arrival and depth of snow may affect the timing um, of migratory movements. So future work, obviously a bane of PhD students is time. So NDVI is clearly missing from this presentation. It's something we will include. Um, also temperature and the relation between snow temperature and NDVI. Reproductive state, for example, if a female is with calf, how does this affect her movements? And then, as I was talking about the snow, understanding the factors influencing the migratory movements of moose. And then also trying to understand what may be causing these shifts in movement strategy from migratory to sedentary. For example, could it be learning? Um, the moose learning, it doesn't actually need to migrate there if the habitat here is good enough. Also fitness, whether it's fit enough to be able to complete the migratory journey. Um, yeah, so I was funded by Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, supervisors Navinda, um, who some of you may have seen speak, speak yesterday, and um, Yeran, and also to Ram for managing our data, and thank you for listening. Got time for a couple of questions. Yeah, so, oh yeah, sorry, so the question was, um, does the density of moose vary from the south to the north? And yes, it does. Um, the moose are generally more dense in the south of Sweden compared to the north, um, also with high density of human pressure um, and also hunting pressure. Um, but yes, yeah, so there is a gradient. One more question? Yeah. What about energy? Yeah. Individuals. So do they differ in the amount of energy they some surrogate of amount of energy they Yeah, um the there's there's a size difference going from the south to the north, which is quite interesting. In terms of moosing the south are smaller compared to moosing the north. And this could be a strategy to cope with the uh, much tougher conditions in the north, but I guess they also have demands on the energy requirements. Um in terms of energy requirements of during a migratory journey. Um, I'm not too sure how, how that would affect it, but we have the physio data coming in now, so I guess that's something that we could start looking at more. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>